It is my particular pleasure to briefly introduce uh, Professor Wolfgang Renneberg. He is a physicist and lawyer. From 1998 to 2009, he was head of the Department of Reactor Safety, Radiation Protection, Waste Management of the German Environmental Ministry. And thus, he was the chief regulator of the nuclear sector in Germany, like Gregory in the US. After that, he was a professor at my institute in Vienna for several years. Nice to see you again, Wolfgang. After retirement, his main focus is the management of the Bureau für Atomsicherheit, a private and independent consulting organization. Uh, Wolfgang Rennebeck's paper is entitled Importance of Risk Assessment Regarding Aging Nuclear Power Plants. Please, Wolfgang, it's your turn. Oh, Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, and um, um, I can start when I have the uh, presentation present here on my screen. And uh, the presentation is uh, just uh, managed by, uh, not by me, but um, by the chair. And uh, um, I need... Um, Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I think I just unsure. I think that hopefully fixed it. Okay. Okay. And then. Okay. Now I think uh, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, I'm, I will be ready to start. Um, at first, uh, good morning uh, to you all. Uh, my presentation uh, deals with the quality of uh, current uh, safety assessments. Um, safety assessments that are practiced to assess the safety of old plants and to decide on lifetime extensions. Actually, um, those assessments decide on the nuclear safety in Europe for the next 10 or 20 years. At first, uh, let me give you a short introduction. Uh, my main question is, can you trust in the practice procedures of safety, safety assessments of the old plants? And how will you judge it? The question is then, um, what uh, will you find when you have a look in the safety reports that are issued by the authorities or the statements on safety issues of, um, yeah, uh, of the authorities? You will, find, you will find tens of formulations that the safety of nuclear installations is assured. Safety safety reports safety um, one moment your fan um, safety reports only demonstrate why the plant is safe or what has to be done to improve the safety of the plant or um, so what is not communicated is what risks remain that could jeopardize safety risks is one of the less frequently, frequently used words in the nuclear community. But how will you judge safety when you don't know which risks remain? Which, with these questions, you are left alone. This is the key point for nuclear decision makers, for political decision makers, and for the people in Europe. 
And this question is the crucial one just now. There's a fleet of old and aged reactors in Europe, nearly 100 and a half. And dozens of reactors are near economic, important industrial centers, near urban centers. And we are now within the, within, uh, the common European phase of plans to extend the lifetime of more than 100 aged nuclear power plants. By the assessment of every single nuclear reactor, the European nuclear safety, safety will be assessed. The decision on the lifetime extension of every single reactor will be a decision on European nuclear safety, and this is the challenge right now. Yeah, in the next part of my presentation, um, I will discuss the need of a new license for old reactors. But at first, let me explain more precisely why we're using the term of lifetime extension. It means that there is a design lifetime for every plant. The design lifetime describes the range of approved safety by the original license. When the plants were licensed, technical experts could not look further into the future than 30 up to 40 years. That was the limit for the calculations and assessments of expected safety. And now the European nuclear power plants are reaching this license or horizon. <clears throat> the consequence, the effects of the license to approve safety by its former procedures, by its tests, by its verifications, and so on, that's gone. That means the significance of the license as legitimation of approved safety gets lost. No one could argue that there have been the periodic safety reviews and the oversights that shall check the safety within the licensing conditions. But periodic safety reviews are not comparable with an administrative and technical licensing procedure, neither in scope, neither in the depth of its examinations, neither in the applied criteria, neither in its procedures, nor in its final uh, appealable uh, decision. The licenses of the H nuclear fleet have phased out, so to say. Not legally, not legally perhaps, but in its inner meaning and in its original purpose and importance. This is the situation in Europe now. How to handle this situation? There's one country you know that has decided not to operate nuclear power plants longer than 32 years and new licenses will not be given by law. That's Germany. Many other countries in Germany and in, in, in Europe have plans to extend the lifetime and their plans up to 60 years. And here arises the question, how to handle this lifetime extension process. When the effects and the legitimation of the former license is gone, you could think of a qualified procedure for a new license. There is generally no fixed state in licenses of European nuclear power plants. So the licenses will legally not strictly expire and force operators to apply for a new license. So legally, there is no obligation to renew the license itself. In the end, Europe has the heritage of old reactors of a fleet with outdated licenses. This is a pan-European issue. Perhaps you will assume that there are at least some European binding rules how to manage this situation, but there is none. Against all statements of the European Commission, or just lately, of the Joint Research Center of the EU. And there are no other international binding rules how to manage this problem. 
the safety goals of the European nuclear directive are not binding for the existing old plants. And there's no international review body. So every European country, every national nuclear authority goes its own way, has its own procedure to extend the lifetime and to keep old reactors working for another 10 or 20 years. What was needed would be a qualified license and licensing procedure to decide on lifetime extension beyond the design lifetime. A qualified license procedure with an integral and transparent risk assessment with defined current safety requirements that correspond to the state of the art, a real participation of a risk-informed public, and an appealable final decision, final decision. Exactly this procedure would be required to decide whether the further operation of an outdated plant is newly legitimated and <laughs> in licensed limits of the current safety requirements. Now that we have learned that there is no real licensing procedure established in Europe for the requalification of the plants, the question is what is actually done in Europe instead and in which way the safety of the old plants is checked to extend their design lifetime. And this I will discuss in the third part of my presentation. <clears throat> yeah, at first, the scope of the lifetime extension checks, checks uh, that are in use. The scope of the lifetime extension checks are planned, that are planned or have been performed um, is not an integral and comprehensive one as it would be under a license procedure. Next slide. You must know that the plants that are concerned have been backfitted during their lifetime, have been technically changed in a lot of features, for example, for example by new components with new interactions among old and newly changed or repaired components, with modifications of the building structures. Moreover, components have changed their attributes by aging, operation procedures have been changed, safety systems have been modified. Additionally, the safety requirements have developed and new risks have evolved that play a decisive role for safety. After all, the plant that now is at the end of its design lifetime is qualitatively another one that it had been once. In other words, the old plant must be regarded as a new entity. What was needed, therefore, is a complete, comprehensive and integral view on the plant as a whole. You that includes the up-to-day requirements for each single part, the assessment of its real safety status and its interaction with an integral and transparent risk assessment with defined current requirements. Oh, attention. Yeah. Oh, I am just on the wrong side. Yeah. Yeah. That, was the, that were the requirements, or should be uh, the requirements, to get a picture of the safety of the old plants. And as you will guess, such a comprehensive view, that's not the way it goes. There's no in integral and comprehensive view on safety under current safety criteria. The safety assessments that are performed take the original licenses as basis, and focus on topical aspects of the plant. They follow the rule that only those actions are taken that can be charged as reasonably practicable. This is what European regulation gives us as safety criteria. Lacking redundancies, missing diversity of the safety systems mostly remain. The question whether the accident scenarios the plant must be designed for are complete remain unanswered. The question whether and how far 
the protection against flooding or against earthquake or an airplane crash is in place, mostly remain unanswered. The real complexity of an old plant raises questions, or the real, yeah, raises questions that are too complex to be checked by an only topical focus of the plant. The result, such assessments without an integral and comprehensive view are not qualified to get a picture of the real safety status of the plant. At first, yeah, second, um, that was the scope, the scope uh, of the uh, safety assessments. Now um, we have a look on the applied safety criteria and the verification management. The existing international safety standards and requirements that could be applied are not binding, as I said, and moreover, these rules are compromised by the European Nuclear Safety Directive, for it says only those improvement, improvements are necessary that are reasonable, pr practicable. And there are no clear criteria to, to decide what this is, what it is. Reasonably practicable in practice means do as you want. Um, yeah, and a structured procedure should at first uh, define the applied safety criteria in order to describe how safe the plant should be. In the second step, should be described the status of the plant as it is and how the data of the plant status are verified. In the third step, it should be analyzed how far the rules are met and to what extent the plan misses the safety criteria. And in the end, you must show which risks remain. This is, um, um, this is visualized by these safety deltas that play a decisive role. If you don't know the safety delta, the difference between the reasonably practical uh, improved safety status and that what safety really means, then you don't know what safety is, uh, is currently uh, implemented in the plant. Such a procedure to um, describe safety data is a poor logical procedure. And the papers of the ILEA and the VENRA, they recommend this structure. But this procedure is no common practice, nearly nowhere within the nuclear community when the safety of the old plants is put into question. What is the reality, the practice of the administrative lifetime extension procedures? There are several techniques of operators to cope with the problem of old plants. The first technique is sizing down safety criteria. The current safety criteria that correspond to the state of the art are not applied. The argument is it does not fit to the old plant. It does not make sense to apply it. So criteria are redefined to fit to the plant. Second technique, neglect safety criteria. That means that applicable criteria are simply mentioned. Third, define safety criteria and find new ways to verify them. This method hides sometimes behind the words realistic calculations. This means that safety margins in the calculations are reduced to reach the safety limit value or new fitting calculations are developed. Fourth, missing data. The technique is to replace data by assessments of experts without analyzing the resulting risks of uncertainty. If it's evident that relevant safety criteria are not met, then take the parachute and say that backfitting is not reasonably practicable. These methods create a lot of uncertainties and accumulates incalculable, uh, incalculable risks. I will call these risks assessment risks. If you will read the final safety report of such a safety review, you will surely not read anything about the risks that evolve 
in the wake of non-approved assumptions of reduced margins and the deficiencies of the plant regarding modern safety criteria. The safety report will demonstrate safety. How safe this safety is, no one knows. The consequence, you cannot trust the safety report. Once again, the root cause of this dilemma lies in the following structural shortcomings of the practice assessments. There's, there are no integral comprehensive checks, shortcomings in relation to precise current new standards are hidden, and assessment risks are not analyzed. The problem is without knowledge of these risks and deficiencies, essential decisions on safety will stay hidden. Without the knowledge of these risks and deficiencies, you know little of, re of the real safety. <clears throat> How to solve the problem? And with this question, I come to the fourth part of my presentation, to the role of a risk report. <clears throat> the answer is, you need a qualified report on remaining risk and deficiencies. And in the following, wait. And in the following, I will outline essential elements of such a report as consequence from the, uh, of the considerations before. The report should include a description of the remaining risks and shortcomings and an integral judgment of the shortcomings, the safety deltas, when the current safety standards and criteria are not met and when assessments are made with uncertainties the so-called assessment risks. The following elements should be included in the risk report. The applied safety criteria and the safety goals, all considered scenarios of possible accidents, all deviations from the requirements and principles, especially of redundancy of diversity and the independence of the different safety levels. Incompleteness of the databases and the compensating measures taken, judgment of the impact of the resulting uncertainties, report on compensatory safety judgment by personal experts, and the judgment of resulting uncertainties, report on the general management with uncertainties and missing data. Uh, deviations from proved and validated methods of calculations that are relevant for the safety evidence and the impact on the original safety margins. <clears throat> the, report, the report of the safety margins uh, of all safety relevant components and in how far they are reduced and at last all load assumptions that are not deduced from confirmed data. Demanding such a report seems to be a matter of course. The risk considerations that are demanded should belong to a common safety culture, should belong to a common safety culture of nuclear operators and authorities. And moreover, uh, there are rules of the IAEA uh, of the International Agency Energy of the International Agency uh, that are demanding more or less is the same procedure, but it's not. But it it is not practiced, and uh, it's not at all practiced. Such a report on remaining risks and deficiencies, I think, could change the game. It could be a real transparent basis for the final decision of the nuclear authority. It would tell the public and the political decision makers what and in which way had really been, yeah, and what and in which way the plant, the safety had really been checked and approved. It would enable an open, rationally guided deliberation with participation within participation processes. It would strengthen the trust in the nuclear decision makers. And in the end, it would be a cornerstone of pan-European understanding of its nuclear risk. 
Yeah. And at the end, the conclusions, um, decisions, decisions on a lifetime extension of old nuclear reactor should only be taken under the following conditions. An integral and comprehensive licensing procedure that is equivalent to the scope of a new license. Safety criteria corresponding to the state of science and technology as benchmark for safety. And the report, the qualified report um, uh, of a risk assessment. Yeah, thank you. That's it. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, for your presentation. We are coming now to the Q&A session. And I will start with several questions to Gregory. <laughs> the first one is, uh, do you see that in the foreseeable future that the price of nuclear power installations could decrease again? Well, there, there certainly is an effort to, I would say, at least maintain uh, the price uh, or the costs for operation. Uh, certainly, I think the industry is trying to decrease the cost because, as I said, that is really the biggest issue the industry is facing in the United States. Uh, there have been efforts over the last several years, the last 10 years, really, to try and bring down the operating and maintenance costs, which are driven primarily by staffing needs. Um, so, you know, I think that those efforts will continue. I think it will be very, very hard to do that because uh, certainly as the plants continue to operate, they will only get older and, and most likely will have increased needs and operational needs that, um, that uh, will make it more difficult to, to operate. Um, so, I, you know, I, those efforts are underway, but I think, it will be, I think it will be very, very hard. I think they've done as much as they can to really reduce prices or to bring, bring prices under control. Mm -hmm. And uh, the follow-up is, uh, what is your view on these more modular reactors? Uh, do you see a chance that these smaller reactors, so to say, will become economic in the U.S. and also maybe in the future worldwide? Yeah, it, it, you know, the, I don't see them becoming... I don't see them as currently economic in the U.S., and I think for them to become economic in the U.S. would take probably 15 to 20 years, at which point I think they would no longer be relevant. Uh, so I, I think the, the likelihood of SMRs becoming a substantial uh, uh, player in the electricity market in the U.S. is very, very low. Um, you know, worldwide, it's it's hard to say. I mean, the U.S. does have a very different economic um, environment for electricity than other parts of the world. We're blessed with essentially ample natural gas, ample renewable resources. Uh, so we really have a choice of, of uh, options in the U.S., and, and that means largely the economic factor drives most of the decision making. So um, in other countries, it may be possible that SMRs could be competitive or implemented for policy reasons beyond uh, pricing, but um, certainly in the U.S., the projections right now are that, that uh, SMRs are not economic and, and could only achieve economic um, competitiveness with significant economies of scale, which it seems unlikely to happen. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Now comes the longer point from Professor Thierry de la Roche-Lambert from Mulhouse. Uh, he is uh, elaborating on the life extensions of uh, example of the Turkey Point 3 and 4 reactors. And he says that the high energy neutron fluxes beyond the 1 MeV range is increasing heavily when we come to reactor lifetimes of 60 years or more. Uh, neutron fluences then will be well beyond 6.5, 10 to the power of 19. But then neutral embrittlement will be accelerated. And uh, he refers to Professor Odette's uh, works. In, uh, he has shown that the uh, ductile to um, uh, fragile transition temperature uh, is then proportional to the fluence. 
and this will cause problems. In, in particular, um, uh, this uh, will involve a serious safety issue for the vessel integrity in case of uh, pressure thermal shocks and crack propagation. And he is interested in hearing what you are thinking about that. Yeah, I mean, this is certainly one of the biggest issues uh, facing the post 60 year plant operation. So in the uh, mid 2010s, uh, the NRC updated its analysis methodology for pressurized thermal shock evaluations um, to essentially push issues beyond the first 20 year license extension for, for most plants. Um, but during the second subsequent license extension, this will be an issue that plants will have to monitor. Uh, yeah, and this is one of the challenges of the license renewal process in the United States is it does not require a safety review of these issues. What is required is that the programs will be in place to monitor the vessel integrity from these effects of aging. And so it's a very, very different kind of review. The belief basically is that issues like pressurized thermal shock are already covered in the existing regulations. So no in-depth review of these phenomenon um, you know, will be needed. And effectively, if, if in year 65 of operation, the vessel were no longer seen to be viable, then that would be an issue for ongoing oversight rather than a, a licensing issue um, for for license extension. And you know there are methods allowed under NRC regulations for vessel uh, repair. Um, obviously, vessel replacement could could always be done, but is unlikely economically. Um, so most likely, when this becomes an issue, and it will become an issue for at least some plants during the post sixty year operation, um, if plants operate that long, then, uh, you know, I think we'll see efforts to try and do vessel repair or, or vessel integrity Im improvements. Um, and that will be, I think, a very interesting technical and safety discussion at that time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, are then the Frage vier. Yeah. Um, the, the aging programs for license extensions rely, of course, on operating experience. You have explained that. But reactors close for many reasons now. And uh, is then also operating experience diminishing? And has that consequences for the safety debate? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, again, with there's there's many pressures that come from operator reactors closing. And the one thing I would say is that aging management doesn't necessarily rely on uh, operating experience directly either. It, it is a, you know, in the, in, the, in the NRC term, those are very, very specific terms and very specific programs. And the aging management is not, it, it, I'll say this the best way, but it's not as high of an integrity of a program as the operating, um, the operating uh, experience program. So, uh, it's a it's a very different kind of program and not necessarily treated to the same level of, of integrity. But it certainly, as as you know, fewer plants operate, uh, certainly the operating experience diminishes, and moreover, some of the cost factors also um, increase because some of the uh, you know, some of the operating experience programs are shared resources across many plants of, of similar types. And so as you have more plants shut down, those costs are borne by fewer reactors, um, which makes it more likely that those programs will not receive the same level of attention that they would have um, previously. And of course, at a time when those programs become more and more significant, um, that's, uh, I think, a bad, a bad recipe for safety. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Someone is referring to the latest report of the International Energy Agency on projected costs of generating electricity that's from the uh, end of the last year, December or something. And uh, in that uh, report, when they stated that nuclear reactors should be the most economic option. Do you have seen that? And can you comment on that? Um, I, I've seen enough of those reports to know that they, they typically over 
uh, estimate contributions of nuclear and underestimate uh, contributions of renewables. I have not seen the latest, but I I know the trend, and they have typically proven to be wrong. <laughs> so, uh. okay, and then uh, Peter Becker is asking to the time schedule, uh, which one can expect concerning small and moderate reactors. Is it viable that they are coming in 15 or 20 years, or what is meant with this time span? Is it the manufacturing or going into operation? What What is your opinion about that? Yeah, that 15 to 20 year time frame would be, would assume that, say, within the next 10 years, you have SMRs beginning to be deployed and deployed then steadily over the subsequent, say, 10, five to 10 years, in which case, you know, if you had that significant level of interest, you could potentially see significant, sufficient manufacturing to achieve some of the economies of scale. I think that's unlikely to happen, but I think that's when the earliest you would start to see it. I mean, you would, you know, the estimates, you know, they vary, but you, you're talking about having, you know, hundreds of modules under um, at least under order or under manufacture to kind of achieve the goal of SMR technology, which is a, kind of a factory manufactured reactor that can then then be deployed, you know, relatively easily at a reactor site. And so I think that, you know, the, the current only SMR design that is partially approved in the United States is expected to deploy between 2029 and 2030 at the earliest, if, if it will ever even deploy. So um, that's, you know, about 10 years from now. And, um, and, but it's only six modules or so. And so really to achieve this economy of scale, you need hundreds. So you'd need multiple plants over, over the next, you know, 15 to 20 years. And as I said, I think that's unlikely. There's another question from Thorsten Neubert who refers to your statement that analog control of safety and other related systems uh, could or should be a downside. And he is asking whether that is true in case of uh, cybersecurity problems we are facing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly, it's certainly, you know, this is the one advantage that most people would point to for a lot of analog systems is, is the theoretical, um, well, the, the, the experience of analog systems being not digitally integrated. Uh, but I think you can achieve those same goals with, with proper um, separation of digital systems. Uh, you know, it certainly does introduce a different level of um, of cybersecurity threat, but it, it's something that uh, I think overall, you know, the benefits of digital instrumentation and control outweigh those those concerns. I mean, there are you know there are other concerns with digital instrumentation and control, common cause failure um, that could be evident through um, you know, and this is a, a, through you know, manufacturing of you know semiconductors or whatever the underlying architecture is and. Um, so, you know, it does introduce new challenges, but overall, you know, it's from a practical standpoint, certainly in many ways, a, largely not even, a, a, it's, it's largely a moot point because you know, many of the elements of these analog systems are just simply no longer manufactured. And, and, and eventually you, it will be very, very difficult. Spare parts are at, at a premium and, um, you know, parts are obsol obsolete and you just have the practical inability to to upgrade without significant expense and um, and you know manufacturing uh, capability, so that will happen. I think you know as time goes on, but it, it certainly is a, an, an issue that um, you know needs to be addressed, but can be dealt with. I think effectively simply by ensuring um, lack of integrated uh, integration into ex outside external systems. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, you're on mute. Thanks. <laughs> well, there are some questions to Wolfgang Renneberg on the level of, of RENRA, the European regulators, and IEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Are there already discussions about uh, risk reports as you have outlined? Are there moves in that direction? <laughs> 
Um, no, uh, there is uh, really uh, no approach I know uh, that, uh, yeah, discusses uh, the role and the importance of a risk report. Is that um, if you uh, and that's and that's something I also also noticed in uh, Greg's uh, presentation. Yeah, it uh, seems quite normal that uh, the risk of the old plants are managed, yeah? And you have a look at aging management, you have a look at some systems uh, that, yeah, had made problems, and so this is the topical view, yeah? The topical view on the plant, and uh, in the background you have the license, and uh, uh, you you really have the feeling, oh, um, the authority on the operator says, yeah, we know our plant, yeah? We know our plant, and we know what you do, and they are improving some things, some others not. And a systematic approach, yeah, a holistic view, an integral view, comprise, compre, comprehensive view, and that's what in the end shows what risks are left. This is, I think, more a legal approach, yeah. It's a, it's a, and a public approach of those. Yeah, who are confronted with con 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 uh, with consider uh, decisions of of the authorities. Yeah, if someone will 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 learn what safety, yeah, is this safety uh, uh, that is uh, confirmed by the authority? He has no chance. He has no chance, for he nothing knows about the risks that are hidden in the plant. And that is the role of the risk report to reveal those risks and to make it as a uh, to 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 uh, to make it a basis for public discussions, for political discussions, and for the for the for the discussion for the of uh, the safety of the plan. And this is a new, yeah, it's a new approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, then. Uh, different approach uh, first originally would you comment on the autopsy of the commissioning reactors as a significant age management program for license extension i had difficulty to understand that question the question if you have the same problem i can ref ref perhaps, perhaps i would i would start to uh, first to to, to uh, uh, comprehend uh, uh, to understand this question. Uh, I understand the question. Um, do you consider the existing um, uh, programs for aging management uh, in your in your consideration? Uh, if that is true, yeah. Uh, if this is the question, um, yeah. Uh, I consider the uh, aging management processes within my proposal. The aging management is one part. Yeah, it's a topical look at at uh, the plant. Yeah, as Greg says. Yeah, you at first have a look as a, uh, at the passive components. Yeah, like pipes. Yeah, like walls. Like like uh, like the uh, reactor pressure vessel, and have you have a look uh, uh, at the embrittlement. And uh, but this is a special look. It's only a special look. You don't um, uh, you don't uh, have a look at uh, the question. What is about yeah the earthquake yeah yeah what is about earthquake? Are there new yeah scientific results that must be yeah included yeah in a safety assessment? Uh, and uh, most of the old plants have no qualifiers yeah earthquake design yeah and this is a real yeah it's it's a it's a relevant question yeah and earthquake is only representative for external events um for other um, for other um for other events that could jeopardize safety and all these things are not um um yeah are not um element of um, of aging management so uh, shutting down reactors could be a measure in in, in terms of uh, uh, aging management programs. 
Yeah, if you uh, if you really want uh, to uh, assess safety of an old plant, I think um, um, it's a it's a heavy duty. It's, it's a heavy heavy uh, task, and I think uh, um, yeah, authorities and the operators fear that risks are revealing, that risks are shown, and I think they try to avoid that, and. Uh, there is no other reason, yeah, for uh, hiding risks, yeah. and uh, and uh, maybe uh, um, yeah, um, a new proposal. But in my view, a risk report, yeah, is needed to understand what safety is. Yeah, without such a risk report, you can't understand how safe the plant is. So, yeah. Gibt es eine neue Frage? Ja, Frage mal. Ah, ich kann sie nicht ganz lesen, ob das fehlt. Mhm. Also, uh, another question to Greg. What about harvesting the observable and measurable material science from decommissioning plants for extension reviews? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly, um, well, <coughs> You know, specifically in the United States, it, it, it's not something that um, plant owners are required to do. Uh, and you know, typically, once plants shut down, uh, they're looking to minimize expense and and um, and essentially turn the plants either leave the plants abandoned. Um, so th there have been some instances in which. Uh, uh, information has been gained from decommissioned plants or in which decommissioned plants have been able to be used to investigate uh, operating reactors and, and potential material degradation issues. But, you know, in general, it, it's not a requirement and it's something that um, would likely be expensive and, uh, you know, operators would likely not want to do given, again, that there are significant economic pressures on plants already. And obviously a, a decommissioned reactor is no longer generating any revenue um and so it's it's unlikely that you know operators would would be interested in actively investigating um their defunct plants in order to support um you know the, the continued operation of other reactors maybe a small follow-up Someone, I don't know the name at this point, uh, has proposed that Fessenheim 1 in, in, in France, the vessel which was decommissioned after 42 years, could be cut into pieces for scientific analysis and research on aging. Is that a way? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there are, you know, there, like I said, there are some plants in the U.S. where that has happened, where components have been taken out and, and uh, EPRI or other organizations have attempted to, um, to use those facilities for a variety of purposes. You could use them for, um, you know, testing to verify non-destructive testing techniques. Um, as well, again, you could use it to do studies with aging management, but somebody has to pay for that. And, uh, and it's unlikely that the operator will pay for it. Um, you know, research institutions would have to acquire it or other or government organizations, but it, it's something that has to a limited extent been done in the United States and, you know, certainly would provide valuable information. Uh, and, um, and I think that, uh, you know, those are all good ideas, but I, I think they're unlikely to happen. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And to Wolfgang Renneberg again, uh, what is really needed to implement into a risk report? And you have stated a lot about that. Maybe we can underline this or that. And um, the, the state of the art is a benchmark. <laughs> what does it mean? And what would you suggest as a review frequency? How many years or something? Um, yeah, I, 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 I think uh, I would. Uh, uh, I, I can only, I can only repeat yeah, um, that uh, um, the risk report 
tries uh, to um, to explain um, what um, yeah risks are created by unsure assessments that are taken during the assessment. Only and I, I will I will I will end with that. Uh, uh, take uh, take the uh, the reactor pressure of Tionge. Yeah. Uh, in Tionge, uh, you don't really know um, what is the aging structure of the material there, of the steel. Yeah, and you have the data that you have from the documentation uh, when it is was uh, when it is uh, when it had been produced uh, are not there, or there are a lot of missing data. Yeah, and there are no possibilities to uh, get data by destructing the reactor pressure vessel. That's not possible. And in the assessment, yeah, is it safe or is it not safe? Experts say, yeah, we will assume yeah, uh, the attributes of the steel are as follows. Yeah? And those assessments of those experts replace yeah, a real uh, analysis of the material that you can get, yeah, and there results a risk, yeah, and who knows what risk is this, and you must report about that, and you must assess it, and that's uh, the uh, the um, yeah uh, the reason for the for, for the for the um, for the risk report. To make it short, uh, ten years of safety periods in the oversight, yeah, that's okay. But when I saw the practice in Germany, yeah, uh, the, uh, the results of such safety reports needed years and years and years to be published. And uh, the practice uh, was not uh, really effective. Uh, but I think um, I have to stop here yeah, for um, the questions. Um, I go um, yeah, uh, for to too much time than, uh, that we do not have. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to you both. It was really good to see that we could bring in more than a dozen of questions which you have answered in a good way. And now uh, we hope that uh, Greg will have a nap again <laughs> so that he can start the day again in two or three hours. And uh, we will have a short break now and we are over time already. And I would ask the contributors from outside to use not unusual abbreviations in their questions because we cannot know all the abbreviations you are familiar with. Please write it out as far as possible. <laughs>